Quick reminder again um, that next Wednesday, the class will be on Zoom. Okay. I will not be here. You're welcome to show up in this room and watch the Zoom session on your laptop. It makes you feel better, but I will not be here. Okay. Um, next Monday, we have no class, which means you have a week to kind of catch up, right? With on things like what and picking a company and getting started on this process. So you picked a company yet? Intel, okay. Um, you pulled up some financials for them yet? Yeah, did you pick up, pick up, pick up an annual report maybe? Yeah. Uh, what's the last annual report? 2022 or 2023? You have the 2023 annual report? Mm -hmm. Oh, the 2023 annual report. Many of you, if you look at the last annual report, it's going to be 2022 numbers, right? The 2023 numbers are starting, the, all these earnings reports are coming in. The 10K usually comes out earlier, so some of you can try for that. But here's a reality we all face. When we value companies, we want to use the most updated information we can. You know why, right? Because I'm buying NVIDIA today, not on December 31st of 2022 or 22. So we want the most updated numbers, which for market numbers is constantly updated. And I ask you what the T-bond rate is, you can go look it up right now. But now I ask you what the revenues for your company were or your earnings for your company were, you go look it up in accounting statements. There's a place I'm going. Accounting statements don't get updated every minute of every day. They get updated at the end of every quarter, not immediately, right? So we have a September 30th quarter end. You don't get the numbers on October 1st. It's quicker than it used to be, but it might be three, four, five weeks later. So let's say you're sitting down to value a company today. You pull up the last 10K for your company, the last annual report, and it's 2022 numbers. Your company hasn't come out of the 2023 numbers. For about half of you, this is going to be true. You're valuing your company today, and you really like annual reports. And here's a practical question for you. Would you do your valuation using the last annual report, even though right now it's almost a year old? 
can things happen in a year? It's kind of a stupid question. Of course they can, right? So what I'm trying to say is don't do it. If it's right, if you have 2023 20, annual reports and they will just start to come out, clearly that's okay. But that's okay only because we're early in the year. By the time you get to October, November, December, they're going to get old as well. The nature of accounting information is it's going to get dated and you want to try to get as updated as you can. Last annual report might not work for you because it's 2022. So here's a second choice. You take the most recent quarter that your company has reported numbers for. Let's say it's September 30th, third quarter of 2023. Can I multiply those numbers by four? I'd like to know the times you can. What kind of companies would you multiply before and be able to get away with it? In, I can't think of a single company where that's going to be true, right? There's going to be something that happens in a quarter. So the answer is, you know, even though there's that escape clause, if nothing happens seasonally, the reality is this is an extraordinarily dangerous game you're playing if you multiply by four. So don't do that. So don't take the annual report, most recent annual report if it's old. Don't take the last quarter and multiply by four. So now we get to the two choices that are potential choices. Even if your 2023 annual report is not out, your company has been reporting quarterly reports in the US. That's not true for some companies in other markets, but I have. Can I bundle together the last four quarters? You know what I mean, right? Third quarter of 2023, second quarter of 2023, first quarter of 2023, last quarter of 2022. It's called the last 12 months, trailing 12 months. In fact, if you have access to most databases, they'll report LTM basically last 12 months. I think that's actually not a bad idea, right? It's updated. It reflects where you are in time. But for some people, it makes them uncomfortable. I'm bundling together two different fiscal years. I don't want to do that. If that is your catch, then there is last option. You can try it and see if it works, which is to take the first three quarters of 2023 for which you have the numbers. And for the last quarter, you fill in estimates. The only problem is those estimates might be available for earnings, maybe for revenues, but the rest of your income statement, you're just making up crap. So when you look at updating your numbers, go with trailing 12 month numbers. And we'll talk about what to do in markets where you don't have quarterly data, but the objective is to get the data. And also dispense with this notion that some are December 31st date is available on January 1st, right? You have to wait till those numbers come up. Today, we're also going to start on our discussion of cash flows and expenses. And for better or worse, we trust accountants, right? We start with accounting statements. We take their operating income, their net income. So one of the distinctions accountants draw is between operating expenditures and capital expenditures. Daisy, what's the difference between operating and capital expenditures from an accounting perspective? They're both core business expenses, but it brings you revenues and earnings this year. Right? When you pay wages to employees, it's an operating expense. When you pay for material to make things, it's an operating expense because benefit. As opposed to capital expense, which is also related to your core business, but there the benefits come over many years. Right? So if I build a factory as a manufacturing company, it's a capital expenditure. The reason that's a big deal is operating expenses show up in your income statement right below the revenue. What happens when you have capital expenditures? What do accountants do? So first you put an asset on your balance sheet, then you depreciate it or amortize it over time. It makes a big difference, right? So with manufacturing companies, we can see what uh, accountants do. They take the factories, the equipment, they treat it as a capex, it shows up as fixed assets in your balance sheet, they depreciate it over time. But today we're going to argue that accountants are not quite consistent in the way they think about capital expenditures when they leave their preferred domain. Their preferred domain is the old time manufacturing company that happy as hogs, everything works the way it's supposed to. So I'm going to ask you to think about CapEx as expenses that creates benefits over many years. And I'm going to list some items out. And you tell me purely, don't think in accounting statement term, think in terms of is it a CapEx or an operating expense. First is a manufacturing plant, obviously a CapEx, right? Accountants get that. What about a technology company or a pharmaceutical company spending money on R&D? That's a question you need to ask. Does any company spend money on R&D expecting to get a benefit this year? The answer is obviously not. 
In fact, if there were a super capex, you'd put it in there because you might have to wait eight, 10 years. If you're a pharmaceutical company, you see it. Of course, it should be a capex. What about advertising by a consumer product company like Coca-Cola's biggest asset is brand name. Remember, some advertising has nothing to do with getting you to buy stuff this year. It's building a brand name. You saw some of those Super Bowl ads. Many, most Super Bowl ads are not really to get you to buy stuff. It's to build up the brand name of companies. Capital expense? Yeah, you benefit over brand names over decades. What about recruiting and training expenses for an investment bank? Biggest asset is human capital. You're spending the money on recruiting and training because you hope that these people will stay on for three or four or five years. Let's be realistic. It's an investment bank, not for 50 years. It is capital expenditures. The reason I, I kind of stretch this out is, you know, how accountants deal with everything other than A, B, C, and D? You know how accountants deal with it in income statements? It is passes the capital expense test. But where does it show up in, a, in an income statement? It shows up as operating expense, their biggest capex. And you're saying, so what? It completely decimates the meaningfulness of financial statements. It makes your earnings not your earnings, right? Because you subscribe. When you go to your balance sheet, what's the consequence of treating something as an operating expense? You're not showing it as an asset. So when you look at the assets of even the biggest tech companies out there, there's almost nothing there. Because of that, the original sin here that accountants are committing is not in not putting an intangible asset number on the balance sheet. It's in what they're doing in terms of expensing these big capital expenses. So today we're going to talk about reversing what accountants do. It's a pain in the neck because you're redoing the accounting. But I don't see how you can value anything but a manufacturing company without fixing the accounting. So let's go back to where I left you in the lecture notes. And we talked about the cost of debt. Okay. So somebody help me out. What's, what's the cost of debt supposed to measure? The rate at which you can borrow money. What are the two finishing words that tell you what it is? Long term and today, right? long-term into that. The way we get it to start with a long-term risk-free rate, we add a default spread. Easy scenario is you have a rating for the company, use it to get the default spread. Toughest scenario, you don't have a rating, you estimate a rating, a synthetic rating based on the interest coverage ratio, you come up with the spread, the cost of debt. There's one little tangent I want to talk about. There are some companies that get subsidized debt. What's the essence of subsidized debt? People are lending money to you at below the market rate. Why would they do that? Green energy companies get this all the time. First, who lends them the money? They don't. Green energy companies are disasters waiting to happen. If you're lending based on the collateral, what exactly are you going to sell? The solar panels so you can't get your money back, right? I wish it because then they'd be borrowing at a fair market. If the low rates are justified by the fact that they have collateral and they're safe, I don't have a problem with that. The essence of subsidized debt is that borrowing at rates below what they should be paying. Yeah. Now, if it's so big and safe, then I'll lend you at a low rate. It's not a problem, right? So if, again, we're looking for a mismatch, a company that shouldn't be. And why? What, what is our existential problem? At least, you know, COP28 just ended, right? We have climate change and, we, of course, one of the things, and again, I'm not contesting that, but it does mean that a significant number of green energy companies are able to borrow at below market rates, either because governments lend to them or worse. And the reason I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell you why it's worse, they force banks to lend to them at below market rates. The reason I think that's horrifically dangerous, who's, whose money are banks lending out? It's your depositor money, right? Do you want your, I mean, let's face it, banks are not the healthiest institutions in the face of the earth to begin with. Look at how quickly Silicon Valley Bank went from being a bank to a basket case. You're taking banks and you're asking them to lend it below market rates. What's wrong with you? But that's a policy question. But sometimes clearly companies are able to borrow it below market rates. 
Embraer was able to borrow at below market rates from the Brazilian government. Why? Because the Brazilian government really likes the company. They think it's kind of a symbol of Brazil becoming part of a global economy. Produce aircraft, not agricultural products or steak. So this is what the new Brazil will look like. And it used to be a government-owned company. So I have a very practical question. Let's assume, remember, we came up with the cost of debt for Embraer, like 9% or something based on your default spread in the country risk. Let's assume that Embraer is able to borrow money from the government at 6%. So it's not a maybe, they're actually borrowing money. When you do the cost of capital for Embraer, my question is, what would you use as your cost of debt? Or more generally, should you be treating that subsidized debt as cheap debt, bring into your cost of capital, which is going to bring down your cost of capital? Okay. Any ideas? If I bring it into my cost of capital, I lower my cost of capital, and I use that as my cost of capital forever. Let's play it through. What are we assuming about the subsidized debt? It's going to last forever, right? If I ignore the subsidized debt, then I'm going to overstate the cost of capital. I'm going to miss the subsidy benefit. Because let's face it, as a shareholder in a company, this is great that somebody's lending to me at 6%. So the both extremes don't work. You can't just plug in the 6% as your cost of debt and move on. You can't ignore the fact that they can borrow money. So is there a way I can split the difference where I can value the company, give them this, the benefits of the subsidy, but not lock it in forever? I can think of at least two. One, yes. You could, but but you have to value the asset. Remember, an in intrinsic valuation, you can't trust the, balance, the accountants to do it. So how would you value the benefit of a subsidy. I'll get you started, right? You could borrow money at 9% without the subsidy. What were you able to borrow at? 6%. Can I compute the interest savings you're going to get because of the subsidy? Yes. If I can compute the interest, let's say you have a 10-year loan at 6% of the interest savings for the next 10 years. All I need is a discount rate. If I take the present value of that, the same, I've got the subsidy benefit. That is, in fact, the best way to deal with subsidies. Keep them separated from the company and value them separately for two reasons. One is it forces you to think about how long will the subsidy last. Right? Ten years, you can bring it in, then it ends. The second is subsidies always come with a cost. Put differently, when governments give you a subsidy, it's because there's something in the other hand they're not showing you, right? I'll give you an example. I remember valuing a sugar company in India. And sugar is a, is a heavily subsidized product. So the government actually sets prices in India that are higher than the market prices, the reverse of the US. So the sugar company benefited from the fact that the government was giving them a higher price than they would get in the market. I said, that's good. Let's value the subsidy separately. And they said, why? And I said, is there a cost to getting the subsidy? They thought about it and said, yes, we are required to sell sugar at below market rates to people who are below a certain income level. The government basically requires that. I said, okay, can we value what that cost is? Do you see where I'm going, right? When you get a subsidy benefit, I'd like to also value what you're giving up as a company to get the subsidy. Because there's a very real chance you might be better off without getting the subsidy in the first place because it comes with that follow-up. So if there are subsidies that you benefit from as a company, don't ignore them. Clearly, you want to bring them in. But keep them separated so you can treat them differently and then ask questions. Should we be even looking for the subsidy or should we just pay it back because it comes with too many strings attached? Let's talk about... Yes. You could, you could. And uh, that's another choice. In fact, the, that was going to be my other, and I didn't mention it. So you could use a 6% subsidized rate for the next five or seven years, the subsidized loan. And then, and that's actually a good point because it does open the door to the real, tr the truth, which is that cost of capital can change over time. Everything can change. So that's another option you can adopt is if, you, if it's a subsidized loan, you know how long it lasts, give them the benefits for the seven years and then let it bounce back. Yes. Take the subsidy out entirely in the terminal value. I would I I prefer not to 
put in subsidies forever. No company can be subsidized forever. Right. But who picked the five years? No, no, wait. You pick the time, right? So if you have a 12-year subsidy, here's my advice. Don't do the terminal value till you're 12, right? So because you said it. So it's unusual when that happens, but when you have a big subsidized loan or a big subsidy that's going to go for the next 12 years. My guess, my 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 advice is do the next 12 years of detail. It's only two extra years beyond the year 10. And then it's gone in your terminal value, you could clean up because whatever you do in your terminal year, you're locked into doing forever. Right? Well, this company is then a pure subsidy. I would say the rest of the company becomes essentially, and that's, I think, part of my problem with green energy is you take the subsidies out, the company's value goes to zero and below. And that's not a healthy place for these companies to be. They're living, I mean, I know green energy companies and they take projects based on what the I, the, uh, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act gave us a huge, remember there are hundreds of billions of dollars growing into green energy. So every project is about how do we maximize subsidies? They're a subsidy machine. Doesn't mean you're worth a lot, but when the subsidies, let, there's no terminal values. What I'm saying is 50 years of subsidies, Aramco valuation, 50 years of oil, and then you're done. Just close up the company, move on, because you'll find another subsidy to take advantage of somewhere else. So we've got a cost of equity, we've got a cost of debt. Let's talk about weights. You, need, you know why we need the weights, right? The cost of equity times the weight of equity, cost of debt times the weight of debt gives you the cost of capital. So I'll give you the choices that you can use to come up with weights. One is you can use book value. You know what book value means? Go to the balance sheet. There's a shareholder's equity number. There's a book debt number. You take book values. Or you can use market values. It's a publicly traded company. There'll be the market cap for the equity. And if you can estimate the market value of debt. I'll jump. The, I won't ask you which one to use because you open up every finance textbook. It's a slam dunk. It should always be market value weights. And we then move on. Like it's religion. Any of you planning to do the CFA? Nobody thinking about it, sir? A couple of hands went up. I don't have a CFA, but I keep begging them to help read me write the exam one year. Because it's become an endurance test. Read 17,000 pages and then ask somebody what was on page 14,335. You don't know, you fail the test. Because they've got to fail like 65% to keep the CFA valuable. But it tests you not, on nothing, right? Memorization, what's on page. So I said, let me write the test one year. So this is my CFA demodern version. So if you, if you can answer this, I'm going to give you my version of the CFA. You can attach it to your name. Just don't get sued by the CFA for doing it. Okay? It's religion that use market value weights as opposed to book value weights. Why do we use market value weights? I'll give you some of the choices. One is because the market is usually right. Is that the reason we use market value weights? Why not? What's the danger of using that argument? Remember, you're doing an intrinsic valuation, right? What's the idea in an intrinsic valuation? The market can be wrong. So at this stage, you say the market is right. I've got you trapped because at the end, you come back and say, NVIDIA is overvalued by 60%. I'm going to say, but you told me the market's usually right. So never, ever open that door. So that's not it. Is it because market values are easy to get? As opposed to what? Book values, right? You open up the balance sheet, it's right there. So that can't be it. It's just as easy to get book values. Because book values are meaningless. I feel tempted to go with this because I so dislike what accountants do on balance sheets. But I'm not going to go with it. It's too easy. So what is the reason we use market value weights? Most people who do DCF don't even know the reason they use market. They just use it. I'm going to give you the answer. So when you do the CFA test and you see this question, answer it and claim that you came up with it. Every discounted cash flow value. You, you want to try? What do you think it is? You're very close. And if you raise equity right now, you'd have... The, every discounted cash flow valuation is a hypothetical acquisition of the company in the market today. So you'd have to go buy all the equity. You'd have to go, in a sense, buy all the debt. And guess what you'd have to pay? 
to pay market value weights. This is a transaction argument, which is if you have to buy it, this is what you'd pay. The fact that you think it's too low or too high is completely irrelevant. Can you imagine me going out and trying to acquire NVIDIA at $410.55, which is my value? I can try. I'm going to do an acquisition. The stock is trading at 700. It's not going to fly. What I think is the intrinsic value is irrelevant at the acquisition stage. And that's how we resolve this great contradiction of claiming to know the value of a company and using market value weights. Market value is what I have to pay. Intrinsic value is what I think this company is worth. So the market value weights are what I need. So I'm now ready to bring the numbers for Embraer, which I've kind of talked about off and on through this entire discussion. So in 2004, first, I chose to compute my cost of capital in US dollars. What does that tell you about what currency I did the valuation? in? I did it in US dollars. Why? Because there was no 10-year government bond in REIs then. I couldn't even get started in risk-free rate. So I did it in US dollars. So where is it going to show up? Guess what this 4.29% you see as a risk-free rate is? That's a UST bond rate. Why? Because I'm doing my analysis in US dollars. The beta 1.07, if you remember, is my levered beta using the gross debt ratio. Remember we talked about gross debt versus net debt? I don't know whether you remember the risk premium, but let's go with the lambda approach because you know, Embraer is a Brazil. The 0.27 came from that lambda regression against the country bond. And the risk premiums, you see, the 4% is a mature market premium. The 7.89% is a country risk premium. So my cost of equity is in dollars. It reflects the country risk in there and reflects the fact that Embraer gets lots of its revenues outside Brazil. That's why the lambda is low. So I have a dollar cost of equity. To get the dollar cost of debt, I start with the same risk free rate, but I had two default spreads, one for the company based on the interest coverage ratio and one for the country. Remember that burden that you carry as a company in a risky country? My cost of debt is 9.29%. Pre-tax. The marginal tax rate in Brazil is 34%. So I've got a cost of equity of 10.7%, an after-tax cost of debt of about 6, 6.5%. And for the weights, I look at the market value of equity. It's a publicly traded company. That's a market cap. And for the market value of debt, I could have used book value. Most investment bankers use book value as a measure of market value of debt because so much of debt is not traded that they kind of throw up and say, how different can it be? Most of the time, you're going to be able to get away with it, but I'm going to give you a neat little trick to convert book debt to market debt. When you look at Embraer's balance sheet, you will see a book value of debt of 1,953 million reais. That comes right off the balance sheet. If you look at the income statement, there's an interest expense of 222 million. So that comes out the income statement. And if you look at the footnotes for Embraer, and you can get the footnotes from many companies. They report a weighted average maturity of when the debt comes to you. They'll give you a, a schedule. Debt in year one, year two, I took a weighted average. The weighted average maturity was about four years. You think, where is this going? Do you know how to price a, if, if I gave you a bond, do you know how to price a bond, right? What do you need? Coupons, face value, maturity, and a market interest rate that you can use to discount them back. What if I treated this as a gigantic coupon bond? The coupon is going to be 222 million a year for four years. At the end of the fourth year, you get the 1,953 million. And I'm going to discount it back at the 9.29% cost of debt I have. And what I get as a present value is 2,083 million, higher than the book value, because my market interest rate is actually a little lower than the book interest rate, this company at least. It's a neat trick because it means you can take any company, take its consolidated debt and replace book value with market value. A market value of equity, market value of debt, the weights I come up with based on those numbers is 84% equity, 16% debt. For God's sakes, make sure the weights add up to 100% again, okay? Because otherwise your cost of capital is gonna be all over the place. This company is 84% equity, 16% debt. The cost of capital in dollar terms is 9.97%. It took us a long time to get to this page because with all these ingredients we had to get in place, country risk shows up in the equity risk premium. Betas and alphas tell you something about relative risk. Risk-free rate based on the currency. Default spreads based on either an actual rating or a synthetic rating. But this is the end game. You need a cost of capital for your company. 
Now, when you think about that cost of capital, it's a dollar cost of capital. So let's say you pick a company to value and you decide to do everything in dollars. It's April 15th, maybe April 29th. Let's make it May 4th, two days before the project is due. And you change your mind. My reaction is, what's wrong with you? Why would you change your mind two days before? But you change your mind. You change your mind. You say, I want to do everything in reals. I'm not comfortable with this dollar valuation. That sounds like a lot of work, right? Because you've got to go back and get a new risk-free rate, a new beta. Basically, you think about the process. And you can build up from scratch. You can start with the risk-free rate. But there's a much quicker way in which you can convert your cost of capital from one currency to another. Remember we talked about how inflation differences are what drive differences across currencies? So let's say I have the cost of capital, 9.97% in dollar terms. I want to convert it into a nominal REI cost of capital. All I need are two numbers. One is expected inflation in the US, so it's 2%, and the second is expected inflation in Brazil, 8%. You can just add the 6% if you're in a hurry to the US dollar cost of capital, which will give you 15.97%. Or if you want to finesse it, you can compute this compounded number, 16.44%. Take advantage of that trick to be able to move across currencies. Even if you don't use it in this class, it's going to stand you, it's going to be help you out when you're not talking to somebody who thinks in a different currency. Because you'll have to be doing this conversion constantly in your head to make sure you're talking about the same thing. One final loose end on this cost of capital that I want to tie up before we leave it behind. I mean, so far in my cost of capital, there are only two ingredients, right? Debt and equity. And if you're lucky in your company, that's all you'll end up with. But there are companies which have what are called hybrid securities. What are hybrid securities? They're like part debt, part equity. I'll give you two examples you'll run into. One is convertible debt. Convertible bonds are part debt, part equity. The debt part, of course, is the interest and the coupon part. The conversion option where you can convert into shares is equity. So convertible bond is part debt, part equity. And when you have these hybrids, people struggle with them because they, they then create a third component of the cost of capital. You've got debt, you have equity, and you have convertible debt. And that's a recipe for disaster. So here's what I would suggest. If you have a hybrid, see if you can break that hybrid down into its debt and equity components. And it's actually not that difficult to do. If you have a convertible bond and you price it as if there were no conversion option, you're going to get a straight bond value, right? That's your, the, your debt value. Whatever is left in the bond is conversion option or equity. You don't need to know any option pricing. It's you're basically breaking the debt down. So what you're effectively doing is getting rid of the hybrid and putting it into, it's nice to have just two buckets in your cost of capital. And this is a way in which you can get there. So here's my example. Let's suppose you have a $125 million face value convertible bond and a coupon rate of 4% on the bond. That's much lower than your market interest rate of 8%. You're saying, why would people buy my convertible bond if the coupon rate is so much lower? Why would they do it? Because I give them the conversion option, right? You get this nice bonus. A lot of growth companies, you know, companies that look like basket cases will issue convertible bonds. And the reason people buy them at low rates is because of the conversion option. Let's say this bond trades at $140 million market value. What I'm going to try to do is break that $140 million to how much is debt and how much is equity. So what's a convertible bond? $125 million face value, 4% coupon. And the mark, if this were just a straight bond, the market interest rate would be 8%, right? So in the first step, here's all I did. If the equations look you know, messy, it's because you were so used to calculators trading present value functions. What I have as a coupon here is $10 million as a coupon every year for the next 10 years, 125 million times 4%, so an annuity. And at the end of the 10th year, I have 125 million. If I discard them all back at that 8%, which I should have charged, the present value, the value that I get for the bond is 91.5 million. The bond's trading at 140 million. If I subtract out the 91.5 million, that difference, 48 and a half million, is my equity option. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the 91 and a half million, throw it into debt, the 48 and a half million into equity. My hybrid's now gone. I've broken it down into its pieces. 
and I'm back to debt and equity. Right? So hopefully your company doesn't have convertible debt. And if it does, don't freak out. It's not the end of the world. No. So let's, let's recap Every, you know, everything we've talked about in the cost of capital. Your cost of equity should be based on a bottom up beta, should reflect an equity risk premium where you do business and should be in the currency in which you've chosen to do all your cash flows in. Your cost of debt should reflect the rate at which you can borrow money long term today, a risk free rate plus a default spread, and be adjusted for the tax benefit, your marginal tax rate. Your weight should be market value weights. Final point, these things can change every year for your company. As your company becomes larger, as the tax rates change, you can bring those changes into your cost of capital. The last I'm going to say about cost of capital, so any, any questions about cost of capital you want to get out of the way before we move on to cash flows. This is a professor here who taught accounting. His name is Paul Cushell. And he's one of the few accounting professors who actually believed in cash flows. So after a while, his name became Cash Cushell. So basically, every time you started the conversation with the account, which is actually very healthy. So we're going to talk about cash flows, but a question about cost of capital. You could, but there are two pieces, right? The question is, in the convertible bond, I valued the straight bond, and I said the rest is option. Could I have gone the other way and valued the option part and called the rest straight bond? I could have. But is it easier to compute the price of a straight bond or is it easier to make the assumptions you need for an option pricing model? Because then the numbers won't add up to 140 million, right? This is the question. If you valued the option and it didn't come up with enough to get, because remember the sum of the two has to be equal to 140 million. We know that that's the only number we know is the market price that people are paying for the bet. If you did not have a market value, then you can use an option pricing model. And the, it's, yeah, that's what it is, right? All options to convert to shares are equity. Yeah. So that's basically the argument. All conversion options go into equity. So let's talk about cash flows. There, you know, a few sessions ago, I laid out the broad foundations for free cash flow equity and free cash flow of the firm. Do you remember the key distinction? What's the big difference between free cash flow equity and free cash flow of the firm? If you were to summarize it in one sentence. One is, well, dividends are part of free cash flow equity, but free cash flow the equity versus free cash flow the firm, what's the key difference? Debt payments, right? That's basically it. One is before debt payments, free cash flow the firm, and the other is after debt payments. Keep that in mind as you look at the calculations. To get to free cash flow equity, I start with net income. Why net income? Because it's equity income. To start free cash flow the firm, I start with operating income before interest expenses. I act like I pay tax on that operating income, but my starting points are different and be very clear about why. So when you see net income starting your calculation, you're heading towards free cash flow equity. You see operating income, you're heading to free cash flow. To compute free cash flow equity, the next thing I do, I subtract out what I'm putting back into the company reinvestment. In what? Capital expenditures and working capital. It's true that some of that capex is going to be paid for by depreciation. Why? Because remember, when I have depreciation, I lower my earnings because I have the depreciation, right? So this line item for depreciation, it lowered my in income. But depreciation is not a cash expense. It's an accounting expense. So money is still sitting in the bank. So what I'm doing is I'm taking that depreciation and paying for some of my capex. In fact, the difference between capex and depreciation is called net capex. It basically measures what you're actually putting in. So if you have a capex of 10 billion and depreciation of 10 billion, you're effectively reinvesting nothing. You're just running in place. So it's net capex that you're investing in long-term assets. Change in working capital is to capture investment in inventory, receivables, short-term assets. So I'm subtracting out reinvestment. And I'm doing that for both free cash flow equity and free cash flow the firm. So I start with the different place. I subtract out the reinvestment. With free cash flow of the firm, I'm done. Once I subtract out the reinvestment. But with free cash flow equity, there's one final stop. I paid for my interest expenses through my net income. But remember, I have debt repayments coming due. That's a cash outflow. And if I borrow money, there's cash coming into the company. So the last item you will see in free cash flow equity is if I have new borrowings, 
their cash inflow and a debt repaid that's cash outflow, I'm going to bring that into the calculation as well. Free cash flow equities after interest expenses and debt payments. Free cash flow of the firm is before those items. But the reinvestment you see in both is exactly the same number. Now, as you work through the problems and you look at the past quizzes, which I strongly suggest you start doing sooner rather than later, because about two thirds of the quiz, we've actually covered the material you need to do, especially the cost of capital. The first two problems in every quiz are about cost of capital and currencies and discount rates, things we've done. And you get to the cash flow part, you will notice that different problems seem to use different equations. And for the, those of you who are equation driven, this is going to drive you crazy. You're saying, you have three different equations for the free cash. Yeah, I do have three different equations for the free cash flow of the firm. We'll talk about how they can coexist. But in terms of thinking through cash flows, here's the sequence. I'm going to start with a number I told you I don't trust, accounting earnings. I have no choice but to start with accounting earnings, net income or operating income. I'm going to come up with how much the company is reinvesting. Again, based on accounting statements, right? I'm going to state in the cash flows, what's your capex, what are you investing? And then if I'm looking at free cash or equity, I'm again staying in the financial statements to look at what that is repaid. So you need to get comfortable with financial statements. I don't like them. You don't like them. But in a sense, they're the raw data from which all these cash flows are born. So here are three different ways I can estimate free cash flow the firm. They're exactly the same end number, but I'm just using algebra to come up with three different equations. The first is, to take after-tax operating income and do what I just did, subtract the dollar reinvestment. So you have $500 million in after-tax operating income and you reinvest $200 million. My free cash flow of the firm is $500 minus $200, which is $300 million. I could call this combined amount reinvestment, right? Instead of breaking down net cash. It's the same thing. I don't know how many of you have been doing the valuation of the week, but you'll notice in all the free cash flow of the firm calculations, whether it's for Tesla or Ramco or any other company, I have this one line item. It says reinvestment. You're saying what's in that? Net capex, change in working capital. To me, it doesn't really matter where it goes. It goes out of the company. So when I say reinvestment, I'm talking about net capex and change in working capital. So you'll see me use the words interchangeably. Reinvestment is really my shortcut to all the things you're putting back to grow up. But if I wanted more details, and this is net capex, this is change in working capital. So in the example, I have 500 million in free in after-tax operating income, 200 million in reinvestment, difference is 300 million. What if I took the 200 million I reinvest and stated as a percentage of the 500 million? I get a reinvestment rate of 40%. If I take my after-tax operating income and multiply by one minus the reinvestment rate, 1 minus 40% is 60%. 60% of 500 is 300 million. I end up with the same number. But I want you to get comfortable with all three variations because you're going to see me use all three and you will need to use all three sometimes to get to an end valuation because it's sometimes easier to work with reinvestment rates rather than dollar reinvestment, especially as your company gets bigger and bigger. Now, I could do the same thing with free cash flow equity. I could start with net income, subtract out you know, net reinvestment, subtract out debt, free cash flow equity. I could rename this big reinvestment into reinvestment and take all my debt cash flows and call it net debt. I'm getting to the same place. But for those of you who get comfortable with different language talking about the same things, keep these pages because my end game remains the same. And in fact, with equity cash flows, I could compute what's called an equity reinvestment rate where I take my reinvestment, net out my net debt cash flow, and I say, this is the percentage of my net income that I'm putting back into the business. So somewhere along the way, go through these two pages because you will then see why there are different ways I get to an end game depending on where I'm starting. So a couple of years ago, I wrote a piece on free cash flow to the firm and free cash flow equity. That's become one of my most widely read blog pieces no, I don't know why, because I thought it was going to be one of those things people don't care about, completely boring. But I just took Microsoft and I said, we talk about free cash flow. In fact, one of the ways you can tell that people have no idea what they're talking about is when they say free cash flow and stop there. You know why that's incomplete? To the firm or to equity? And they say, what? Because they think free cash flow is free cash flow. What do you... So I wrote this piece in response to people using the word free cash flow. And companies have started 
expropriating that word and using it in accounting claims, our free cash flow. Tesla claimed it was free cash flow positive five years ago. And my response was, what is this definition of free cash flow you're using? I don't see it. So I wrote this piece basically of, you know, getting from, and I took an income statement and I basically take each. So I, the, the reason I think people liked it is I took the actual Microsoft financial statements that this is where I'm getting CapEx. This is where I'm getting depreciation. This is where I'm getting my reinvestment. And if you look at the buildup, basically I start with net income. The, there's my, you know, the, there's my, my reinvestment, net CapEx and change in working capital. There's my debt payment and there's my free cash flow equity. This isn't rocket science. We're eventually trying to get cash in, cash out, what's left over after I've paid my debt with free cash flow equity and before I've paid my debt with free cash flow flow. If you start with the negative net income, clearly you're in the hole, you're going to get deeper. So don't be surprised if you start with negative net income to end up with negative free cash flow equity. It's not the end of the world. And many of you young growth companies, that's that might be where you start off. So the question then is, you know, how do we get to the best estimate of free cash flow? As I, as I confessed at the start of this process, you are dependent on accountants for your starting point. And that does scare me a little bit. And if you step back and you think about all the things that can go wrong, we talked about one of those things. People use accounting earnings that they don't update their numbers. Any of you valuing Lyft? Do you, do you read about what happened in the last earnings call? What did they, what happened? They made a mistake. Yeah. What was the mistake again? It's a little problem. An extra zero can make a, plus I don't know why people talk in basis points. It drives me crazy, right? It's this, it's this fixed income mindset. Basically, they said our margins improved by 5% when in fact, they really, it was really 0.5%. I don't know who made that mistake. You know, that sounds like a big mistake. The stock went up 60% right after the earnings call began. And by the end of the earnings call, it given up all of the 60%. So, you know, I, sorry for those people who bought, and no, I really am not, people who bought at the 60% rise. You get greedy, you jump on too early, you deserve to lose. But I'm sure there's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Yeah. So, if you look at a company, you start with earnings. You want the most updated number. And as I said, the trailing 12 month is my starting point. Why? Because it gives you the most updated numbers. I can do my valuation then in February, March, April, June, November. It doesn't matter when you do the valuation. There are countries where you don't get full quarterly reports. You get quarterly reports, but only of revenues and earnings. Update what you can. Don't let consistency be the enemy of updating. You know what I mean by that? There'll be people who say, I can't update because not all the numbers get updated. You know, even in the US, not everything gets updated. Things like options outstanding and lease commitments might not be updated in your quarterly reports. But I'm going to update what I can because I want to get them. Here's my rule in my spreadsheet. For every input, am I getting the most updated number I can for that input? Even if it means using September numbers for some, June numbers for others, and the last 10K. There will be cases also where you look at the most recent year for your company. And it's clear, it's an unusual year. Unusually good or unusually bad. You know how you can tell, right? Do more than one year, right? If you do five years and your number is five times higher of five, you know, 20% of what it used to be, something happened in that year. If you take that year's number and make that your base year number, your life will get very difficult because you're now digging out of a number that is really not a number that reflects the company. And it's, so do the common sense thing. If you have five years and your most recent year is the most is, is an unusual number, the fix is to normalize, average across time. Get used to dealing with that when you do cash flows of not just looking at the most recent year, but looking across a stretch of time. That's longer. This is the advantage of using capital IQ because if you use Annual reports, there's nothing in capital IQ you can't get from an annual report. The only problem is annual reports usually report two years of data. So to get five years of data for your company, you have to get four different annual reports. Not, not difficult, but it's a pain in the neck. So if you can you know, go to capital IQ, you can get, in fact, you can download historical data for as long as the company's been around. Since 1989, to download all of the numbers. And finally, you got to clean up after the accountants. They've left quite a mess. 
I remember my first accounting class, my accounting professor came in with three cardboard boxes. These were the days when you had low tech, you know, basically cardboard boxes was the best you could do. And he said in accounting, we're religious about the way we categorize expenses. He was lying, but I didn't know then he was lying. And he said, if you have an expense that creates benefits in the current year, that goes in the operating expense box. An expense that creates benefits over many years goes in the capital expenditure box. If expenditures use associated with the use of debt, it goes in the financial expense box. Operating expenses go up into the income statement right below revenues. Capital expenses get depreciated, and depreciation goes into op, you know, to get to operating income. Financial expenses show up below the operating income line to get an income. It's really neat if you're consistent. We talked about things like R and D and recruiting expenses. And we talked about accountants not being consistent in treating in what are really capital expenses as operating expenses. So we're going to talk about that. And until 2019, accountants had another almost fatal problem, which is a way of financing that companies use that accountants look the other way and said, if you use that, we're not going to treat it as that. I'm not going to be mysterious. You know, if you think about a Walmart or a Gap and you think about all those stores out there, Remember, Walmart doesn't own a single one of these stores. It leases every one of these stores. Costco doesn't own any of its stores. It leases those stores. You're saying, so what? Those leases are usually long-term leases. You have payments due coming due for the next 5, 10, 15 years. How is that any different from going to the bank and borrowing money? It's a contractual commitment. Until 2019, accountants looked the other way. Now they're doing the right thing, but I want to give you some insight into what exactly they should have been doing all this time. And now they're doing, you know, at least getting it right now. So let's talk about all of these items. So, you know, talk about updating earnings. As I said, this is the easiest part of the fix. Updating earnings now is not a big deal. And many services, you know, like Yahoo Finance, give an LTM. So when you ask for numbers for your company, they'll give you the most recent year, but they'll also give you an LTM. That's the last 12 months. If you did not have access to a last 12 months number, you can do it yourself. If you have a 10K and, and the most recent 10Q, all you need is, you don't need four 10Qs. All you need is the most recent 10K and the most recent 10Q. I'll give you an example. Yesterday I was valuing the Home Depot. Why was I doing it? I was bored. And, and I put up that 2023. I was happy. It said 2023 annual report. And there's one problem. You know what, their fis what, what, what month their fiscal year ends in? January 30th. Who does this? Why would you end your fiscal year one month into a new year? That 2023 annual report is a complete lie. It's 11 months of 2022 and one month of 2023. There's no way I can value the company now with a report that's a year old. So I went and pulled the last 10Q. And because of this weird thing, that was November 30th of 2023. And that had, so when you pull up your last 10Q, it's the third quarter report. They report the revenues, income, et cetera, for the first three quarters of the year. You know what else they report? They report the same information for the first three quarters of the previous year. See how this is going to help you, right? To get to a last 12 months, I took the last 10K. I added the first three quarters for 2024 fiscal year and subtracted out because they were on the same you basically are removing the three quarters you don't need and adding in the three quarters, you're done. You can basically set, it's a very simple, just set up an Excel spreadsheet with all the items, have three columns, last 10K, first three quarters of 20, of the most recent fiscal year, first three quarters of the previous fiscal year, add up the first two columns, subtract out the third one, you got your last 12 month number. Get comfortable doing things on your own so you don't have to have somebody else compute the last 12 months for you. It's not rocket science again. So come up with the trailing 12-month number. You get the most. But now let's talk about correcting for accounting mistakes. Okay? As I said, there are two groupings of mistakes I want to talk about. Financial expenses like leases that accountants have been treating as operating expenses. As they did till 2019. And capital expenses like R&D and maybe even advertising to build a brand name that they've been treating as operating expenses, but are really capital expenses. Let's start with the first one, right? Let's talk about operating leases. First, remember, operating leases are a big deal in some businesses, 
not so big a deal in others. When I'm valuing Facebook, who cares what the operating leases are? No, it's not a big deal. But when I'm valuing a restaurant chain, an Applebee's, no, or I'm valuing a retail company, this is really how they borrow money. So in this table, I've actually listed out the businesses that have the highest lease expense. So you can see where you have to worry most about this lease debt. At the top, you got air transport, then you got trucking, restaurants. So in a sense, you can see the kinds of business that it, where it's a big deal and the kinds of business where it's not a big deal. Let's say you're in a, you have a company in a sector where it's a big deal. Let's talk about, it. first, why lease commitments have always been debt and how to convert them into debt if, the account, if accountants are not doing the right thing. The way I think about debt and equity is not based on what accountants call them. It's based on the commitment you have. Debt is a contractual commitment. Equity is a residual commitment. You get whatever's left over. So when I look at an item, I say, is this a contractual commitment? The answer is yes. I treat it as debt. If I use that categorization, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Leases are debt. There's, it's never been debatable. Much as accountants fought it for a long time. So when you think about Converting these lease commitments to debt, here's all I need to do. If I know what your contractual commitments are for the next eight years, and I treat them as debt, to get the debt value, all I need to do is take the present value of those commitments using your pre-tax cost of debt as a discount rate. You're saying, why pre-tax? Because these commitments are pre-tax commitments. So I'll show you what the mechanics look like. That creates, but when you convert the lease commitments into debt and you put in the balance sheet, you have a problem. You know what the problem is? Balance sheets have this unpleasant requirement, which is they have to balance. So if I put in a half a billion as lease debt, I've got to create a counter asset of a half a billion. Now, when you look at the Home Depot's balance sheet on the asset side, it says lease asset. You're saying, what the heck is that? That is the effect of capitalizing leases now showing up on the asset side. So your debt number will change, your asset number will change. And your operating income has to be restated, right? Because what you used to call as operating income, which is after lease expense, I'm now going to add the lease expense back because I'm saying I should never have subtracted out. But remember when you have an asset, you got to depreciate it over time. You're saying, this is such a pain in the neck. Thank God you don't have to do it anymore. Accountants are doing it for you. But I've actually been doing it for 30 years. I said, I can't wait accountants to come to their senses. So at 30 years when I've computed debt ratios, I've always capitalized leases. Luckily, the adjustment is mechanical. It's not rocket science. So here's how it would have worked in 2000 and, I don't know what year was this, 2003 for the gap. So at that time, accountants were not reading leases as debt. And let's face it, for the gap, this is your big debt that I've got to factor in. So I went to the footnotes for the gap. And this has always been publicly disclosed information for U.S. companies. They disclose what their lease commitments are for next year, two years out, three years out, four years out, five years out. And beyond that, they give you a lump sum. So if you look at the, so this is not something I had to invent or estimate. It's right there in the footnotes. In fact, after year five, they gave me a total amount of 1,976 that I split over two years because I know it's all not coming due in year six. So I've got my contractual commitments. Their pre-tax cost of debt was 6%. Now, where did I get that? Remember, we had the default spread to the risk-free rate. So I've, I've done that already. So I get that cost of debt. I discount the commitments back. What I get as a present value is $4.4 billion. In fact, their conventional debt was only $1.97 billion. You could have looked at their balance sheet and said, this company doesn't have much debt, but that's a lie. It actually has debt of $6.3 billion if you bring the lease commitments in. If you take a company like Walmart, it's amazing how much bringing lease debt in changes your perspective on the company, how much debt it has. In fact, that $6.4 billion is what I used as debt when I did my cost of capital. So on, I've redone the GAPS balance sheet because at that time, they were, accountants were not doing it. I showed $4.4 billion as debt, $4.4 billion as an asset. And then I had to restate the income. I took their stated operating income, $1.01 billion. I added back the lease expense for that year, saying I shouldn't have subtracted out. And for the depreciation, I cheated. Cheated, why? I could do all kinds of depreciation. Some of the year, double, I mean, you present an entire, you probably wasted, what, three accounting classes on 16,000 different ways to depreciate. 
I don't have the time for that. So what I did was I used the simplest depreciation method, which is straight line depreciation. I took the 4.4 billion in debt. And remember the life of this commitments is seven years. I divide by seven. I had lease commitment subtract out the amortization of the lease asset. I get my adjusted operating cost. Until 2019, my operating, my adjusted operating income and debt for almost every retail company and restaurant was wildly different than what accountants were telling me it was. But I'm think I'm, I think I'm on the right side of this debate because this is effectively debt, and I want to factor that into my story and valuation. So I actually did this at the Gap in 2003 because they 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 they, they knew change was coming. They wanted to know what treating lease commitments as debt would do to them. I'll take you through what I did for them because I'll tell you up front, they went through various stages of delirium as I went through this. They were wildly happy halfway through and then a big letdown at the end. So you're the gap and you say, what will capitalizing leases do to me? Well, the first column, you see what the conventional accounting was telling them. It was telling them it made a 1.01 billion but because I capitalized lease, I said, your earnings will be higher. Now they're happy. They said, this is good. We're more profitable than we thought we were. Then I said, there's one catch, though. In the balance sheet, your original debt was 1.97. But now that I've capitalized leases, it looks like you have a lot more debt. So they're a bit of a letdown. That's not good news. We're more levered. I said, but that's good news in a cost of capital calculation. Because my original cost of capital calculation, if I trusted the accountants, they're mostly equity, very little debt. Your cost of capital is 7.3%. And I said, with leases treated, it's, it's only 6.25%. You can almost see them doing somersaults across the room. Saying, this is amazing. This is great. But here comes the final piece. And here's where it's not that good. One of the things we're going to talk about is measuring the quality of a company's project with its return on capital or return on equity. It's lot, lots of limitation. But you do that all the time. You know how we compute returns on equity and capital? We take the income, the accountant's report. And we divide it by invested capital, which comes out of the balance sheet, book values. My return on capital, when accountants told me there was almost no debt, was 12.9%. Once I capitalized debt and brought it in as part of my capital, my return on capital dropped. By this time, they didn't know that whether they were coming or going. Their cost of capital is lower, but the return on capital is lower. Their income went up, but their debt went up. They said, what does this all mean? Is it good for us or bad for us? Will it increase value or decrease value? And I said, there's one very simple metric to figure out whether this is good or bad for you. Ultimately, what you gain as value as a company is the spread you earn between your return on capital and your cost of capital. So before I made the adjustment, that spread was 5.59%. After I make this adjustment, when I look at the spread, it's about 3%. You're not as good a company. But at least you're still on the right side of zero. I remember doing this for Starbucks about five years ago. There was a time in New York where if you didn't have Wi-Fi, all you had to do is walk in the direction of a Starbucks Wi-Fi and you'd find a Starbucks. Like every block, you have a Starbucks. There were like eight Starbucks within like you know, three blocks of here. Okay. The company was just opening too many stores. But analysts loved it. They said, look at the growth. And they looked at the balance sheet, not much debt. Can you imagine how much those lease commitments are on that Broadway Starbucks that almost nobody walks into? So I took the lease commitments, I converted them debt. Before I converted debt, the company looked great. It had a return on capital of 15%, the cost of capital was 11. After I converted to debt, the return on capital went from 15% down to 8%. That's how much lease debt they had which was lower than the cost of capital. That is catastrophic. When you have a company that earns less than the cost of capital and it's growing 30% a year, you're heading towards a wall and it's not going to look pretty. In fact, that's part of the reason Howard Schultz had to come back to Starbucks because the company was heading to a... So they've shut Starbucks down. They've reduced the number of Starbucks, but they still have a lease commitment problem. Yes, They're half-assed right now. This is a problem with accounting. They don't do anything fully the right way. Okay? They brought lease debt onto the balance sheet. Their income is like, God only knows, it's like 2018 version of income. 
this is part of the reason I've kept my lease because every one of my valuation spreadsheets is a lease correction that I bought built 20 years ago. I still use it on every company, even though accountants say, trust us, we've done this. I don't trust you because I've seen what you do. But before we leave this and move on, why am I treating lease commitments as debt? What is it about lease commitments that make me treat them as debt? It's a contract. Right? What was that Saudi team that signed Ronaldo? Do you remember what that contract looked like? What is it? 125 million every year for the next three years or something. Is it a contractual commitment, you think? I'm pretty sure it is. So if I were valuing that team, you know where I would go, right? I would take the present value of those commitments. See, what about the Dodgers? If I have to value the Dodgers, there's an Otani debt on the balance sheet that I have to bring on. This is not just about leases. It's about any kind of contractual commitment. We're just the tip of the iceberg here. And I'll give you one final example. You're valuing Netflix. Anybody valuing Netflix? You're valuing Netflix? No. Okay. But in valuing Netflix, you go to the commitments. They give you the lease commitment. In that same page, they also give you content commitments. You know what those are? You know, Suits most watched Netflix show last year, right? They have the rights to Suits for the next four years. You sort of give you a chance to re-watch Meghan Markle over and over again, I guess, for the next four years. How do they get the rights? They enter into an agreement to pay X million dollars, $80 million for the next five years. Contractual? Absolutely. When valuing Netflix, the present value of those content commitments will become debt as well. So this is not just about leases. It's about any kind of contractual commitment that you want to bring in. Yeah. It's a huge problem with sports companies. It's actually a good, good point, which is if you think about this, this new partnership that Disney, Warner, ESPN have created, okay, think about how you get the rights to live sports, right? You go to the NFL, you sign a 10-year contract, you're giving away your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, or whatever you have as a company, because what that's a billion dollars, a hundred million. So in a sense, these are all huge contracts, which is fine. That's the way you do business. But for God's sake, stop borrowing money if that's the way you do business. Because if you have all these contractual commitments and you go and borrow money on top of those commitments, it's like asking for trouble. So... That's part of the reason I think we've created, you no, know, I've, I've pushed accounting to do the right thing because without it, you get companies doing things that actually get them into trouble over time. So that's a lease commitment. Let's, so this page, I know it's, it's, it's very messy. I've basically traced out where the original sin is. The original sin is in the fact that you're not expensive, which they haven't fixed the original sin. Notice that they fixed the symptom of the problem in the balance sheet. But the original sin came from the fact that you did not treat these expenses as capital expenses. So to really fix this at its core, you have to do it right. It's not just about showing me the lease debt on the balance sheet. You have to go and fix your income statements so they mean something. So as you trace it through, you can see what happens when you do the wrong thing. It affects your debt, it affects your assets, it affects your earnings. Basically, it contaminates your entire earnings. So this is not some, you know, you're not nitpicking. You're changing your perspective of the company because this is a more realistic perspective. Now, as I said, accounting did come to its senses in 2019, at least partially. I think Deepa actually pointed out during class last year, he saw, he sent me his income statement, he said, where is the least correction? And the truth is, they're not correcting. He's saying, how do they get away with it? You know, it, it? I think in accounting, you can get away with things if you can dot your I's and cross your T's. 2019. Okay. IFRS and GAAP, both changes. So now if you look at a retail company, you see lease debt and lease assets. But now you see where it comes from. Seeing the present value, the commitments over time, showing it as a debt and an asset. But to, to explain why you shouldn't wait for accountants, you know what? when accountants knew there was a problem with leases? 
I actually got my hands on a panel discussion that happened at NYU, that was then called just NYU Business School, in 1949. I'm not kidding. Where it was an accounting conference on why leases are debt and why they should be treated as debt. 1949. What did they actually fix it? 2019. So what's the lead between when you recognize there's a problem and you fix it? 70 years. Will accountants do the right thing on R&D? Maybe they will, but I'm not waiting around. I'll be dead by the time they actually do it. And I've got to value technology companies until I'm dead. I've got to do it myself. So don't wait for accountants to do the right thing. Just do it yourself because they're going to mangle it anyway when they get around to doing it. Let's talk about, you know, so actually every year since 2019, when I do my data analysis at the start of the year, I do my lease debt based on computing the present value commitments and I compare to what accountants are telling me the lease debt is. I want to see how close the numbers are. In the US, not bad, right? The accounting estimate is 948 billion, mine is 1.15 trillion. Why is there a difference? Because accounting does give some escape hatches. If your leases are cancelable, for instance, you don't have to treat it as debt, which intuitively makes sense. I treat all these commitments as debt. But in some parts of the world, you can see that the gap is immense. If you're doing a Japanese company, for God's sakes, don't assume the accountants are showing the debt on the balance sheet. They're not. Many emerging markets, it's better to do it yourself. So my advice is, Check the footnotes, see the lease debt, check it against whatever debt is on the balance sheet before you assume the accountants have done the right thing. Let's talk about R&D. Okay. Again, varies widely across sectors. Where is it big? It's big, of course, in drug companies. It's big in technology companies. Okay. It says retail online, I mean, but a lot of, lot of you know, platform companies have the equivalent of R&D. You take a look at the Mag Seven companies. It's a, the amount of money they spend on R and D is mind boggling. Amazon claims to spend eighty six billion dollars on R and D. Must be the better packaging. I keep getting my stuff in. It gets bigger and bigger to have smaller things in it. Right? To find it, it's like going through a, these Chinese puzzles. Is there something in here? I'm just pulling boxes apart. The box inside a box inside a box. It's like a you no. Know. So, but I don't know. There's R and D. But let me again give you the intuitive reason why I think R&D should be treated as a capital expense. The benefits are long-term. I've never again understood why it's even debatable. But to give you a little bit of insight into the, into the accounting mindset, you know, about 12 years ago, I was asked to give the keynote speech at the AICPA conference. Who comes to that conference? CPAs. So this was in Vegas, which already struck me as a little bit of strange choice for accountants to get together. But Vegas has really big hotel rooms. So I show up at this conference intent on making sure they don't invite me back again. So I walk into a room filled with a thousand accountants. This is about as close to hell as I think I can get, right? Yeah. I'm worried about a gang audit by the time this is all done. And I... Get, I put up the title for my presentation. I said, 10 things accountants do that I don't quite get. I have the, I have the presentation somewhere. If I find it, I'll send it to you. One of them, of course, was at that time, leases. What the heck are you guys doing? And then I got to R&D. I said, what do you guys think you're doing? You told me you were consistent that any, any expense. Why do you treat R&D as an operating system? Think like an accountant, because you can probably guess what their what the rationale they gave for why they treat R and D as an operating expense. What do you think it is? What do, why do accountants treat R and D as an operating expense? Exactly, he's thinking just like an accountant. You need to break that mindset very quickly, right? But he said it's too uncertain. I said, really? That's your reason for not treating it as a capex? So if I built a factory in Kazakhstan, would you let me expense it? Warhead could come in and burn it down tomorrow. We've never used uncertainty as a dividing line when we build factories to produce products we might not have a product for, a market for. How magically with our, this, they realized very quickly uncertainty was not going to get them very far because it's very selective. So you know what the second reasoning was? We're just being conservative. 
You see what the conservative part is, right? By expensing R&D, you make your income lower. And you say income lower, that's good, right? It's conservative. Now we can debate whether conservative is good when I want to know the true earnings of a company, but is it really conservative? Because when you expense something, remember you don't show it on the balance sheet. So when I compute things like return in equity or return in investment capital for your company, I'm actually gonna overstate your numbers. So let me cut to the chase. There is no good reason for doing what they're doing. So why do they keep doing it? Because it'll take them 70 years to fix the problem and they've got a legacy problem. Problem with accounting is whenever they make a change, it's got to be consistent with everything they've done historically because you've got a generations of people who got CPAs on the old accounting rules. You can't change too much too soon. So I'm not hopeful that it'll happen, but we know how to capitalize R&D. And here's how you do it. First, you have to specify an amortizable life for you. Saying, what is that? On average, how long does it take between the time you do R&D and a commercial product emerges? You see how they threw the on average up front? I know some R&D will not pay off. Some might pay off in five years. So you're a pharmaceutical company. What do you think the answer to that is? In the time you do R&D, a product you could sell. If you're lucky, 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, think about the three stages of the FDA approval process. If you're a tech software company, maybe three years. Second step, I'm going to collect the R&D expenses every year for that period. Hang in there with me because I'm going backwards. But remember, if I'm going to capitalize R&D, it's not just right now. I've got to have done it all through. So I take each year's R&D expense and I amortize it over time. So if it's a five-year life, I write a one-fifth each year. And I keep track of two things. How much am I writing off this year of previous year's R&D? And how much is left over? So I'll take an example. This was actually SAP, the German software company. I used a five-year life because it does business software. It takes and the R&D takes a lot longer to convert to commercial products. I got the R&D expenses for the last five years. So year minus five is five years. So current year is the most recent year that just ended. Because the most recent year just ended, it's too late to amortize it, right? I just spent it right now. But the R&D expense from five years ago, I'm writing off the last one-fifth and it's now gone off the book. So I track how much I'm writing off, what's left over. R&D from four years ago, I'm writing off one-fifth, there's one-fifth left over. So I keep track of both what I'm writing off and what's left over. So the last thing for today is to think about what those numbers will be and where they show up. If I add the last column, I get an amortization of 903 million. That's what I'd be writing off this year in my income statement. And if I add the second to last column, I come up with a sum of 2.9 billion. You see, what the heck is that? That's now going to show up in my balance sheet as R&D capital, as an asset. I've brought R&D onto the books. People complaining about intangibles not showing up in the books. You're now going to see R&D. It's going to reflect the money you've spent on the intangibles. Because that's how we measure capital investment in every other asset. So I leave you thinking about what I want you to think about in the next week, because you have seven days, is to think about other items like R&D, which are really capital expenses, but people treat as, think platform-based companies like Uber. What is your, what is it you invest to grow? And think about how you'll be treating that expense. I will see you on Zoom next Wednesday.